There is a growing sense of excitement at the University of Utah Hospital. Doctors report Barney Clark and his mechanical heart are doing well. Late today, he was taken off the respirator. He's breathing on his own and has spoken his first words since surgery. A pleasure to be able to help people. And maybe you folks learn something. You people are asking the question, is the process successful? We're telling you, not yet. Uh, you're asking, when will his life really be worth living? And we're telling you that he'll have to answer that question. But at the moment, he has not made enough progress to justify this kind of procedure in multiple patients. In 1983, the whole world watched as an enormous investment in money and technology extended this man's life by a matter of weeks. The exercise broke barriers and pushed forward the frontiers of high-tech medicine. But for the mass of the world's population, what did it prove? Not much, except that curative medicine is continuing to extend its ability to bandage the wounds that our changing society inflicts on its population. The big problem for most of us, though, is that for the real killer diseases of society, there is no cure. But to a large extent, by controlling risk factors in our lifestyle, and risk factors in the environment, they can be prevented. If Barney Clark's artificial heart is an extreme example of high-tech curative medicine, this man, marathon runner Robert D. Costello, represents the other extreme, the ultimate in personal preventive medicine. D. Costello has designed his whole lifestyle to allow him to tune his body to its ultimate efficiency. I run about 30 kilometres a day, and every day I eat about 19,000 kilojoules of pretty carefully planned food. That might seem like a lot, but the training I do burns it all up. I'm 180 centimetres tall and weigh about 70 kilos, but only about 5% of my total weight is fat, and this is compared to about 20% in the normal person. I live and work in an environment where there's little pollution and there's little chance of injuring myself. My whole daily routine has been built around the training requirements that are best suited to me. OK, let's go. I use medical technology to monitor my physical condition, and the training I do tells me how my body's coping. If I see a potential problem, I can avoid it. So you could say that I look after myself pretty well, and I do. I do it so that I can maintain optimum physical condition and avoid illness and injury. But obviously, this sort of lifestyle isn't for everybody. Not everyone wants to look after their bodies, but just about all of us expect to be cured. If prevention is really better than cure, why is formal preventive medicine practiced so little in this country? The cure is in demand, not just when we're sick, but for entertainment as well. Aside from cops and robbers, television is inhabited by more medicos than any other occupational group. Two hours, Doctor. Swap. some spinal damage, but we're almost... Curative medicine is full of human drama. It's entertaining. It's good copy. But it's not easy to conceive a television drama built around preventive medicine. And it's even harder to imagine a blockbuster success about preventive medicine's big brother, public health. There isn't a lot of dramatic tension in, say, the effects of fluoridation or in anti-smoking advertising. Also, for many of us, it's very reassuring to be told by a TV commercial that if you have a problem, it can be fixed by taking a dose of a certain product. So remember, if cramps and pains are eating into your efficiency, 
chase them away with Isodine. Darling, the pain's gone. Oh. Remember, though, if your problem persists, you should see your doctor. Isodine. Another reason for our society's demand for cures is that a good cure can carry with it a lot of status. Doctor said he'd never seen one like it. Go on. He did, so he had it out on the spot. We've got it inside in a bottle. No. On the bedside table. Beautiful scar too. Real work of art. Would you like a look? Could I? He wouldn't mind. He's asleep. Come in and I'll show you. <gasps> Another social factor in the demand for curative medicine as opposed to preventive medicine in our society is that traditionally we don't like being told what to do or not to do, particularly when it comes to some of life's pleasures, like eating, drinking and smoking, for example. Expectation for a cure is very high in the community, I believe. Uh, they expect to be uh, able to do what they like and, uh, and get away with it and then come to you to pick up the pieces at the end. I think it's only recently with, uh, with public opinion that preventative medicine is becoming more a fact of life. Uh, people are pushing for it now. They're prepared to make changes. Presented with a problem, uh, some patients react very favourably. They can see the problem and, uh, and then are prepared to do something about it. Quite a percentage still, however, are very reluctant, uh, I think, based on this curative medicine that they've been living all along. Uh, they expect to be able to get away with it, and uh, they're very reluctant to make changes. I suppose uh, partially because of uh, the, uh, the peer group uh, pressure uh, involved. Um, to, to live in a community where other people are doing things and you're not allowed is uh, a very difficult thing. And that's one of the dilemmas of preventive medicine people don't like to be told to modify their behaviour, even if it's going to benefit them to do it. But if they do become ill, they'll certainly expect to have access to all the skills and facilities of the medical profession to do what it can to cure them. His breathing is mainly thoracic. He does look plethoric around the cheeks. Do you think you're making that up, or is that true? I don't know. I'm not sure that he's awfully plethoric. <laughs> hmm? oh. I thought and some people so are with this condition, but I'm not sure that he's one of them, do you? Yes. So now we can come in a little bit more, a little more closely, and um, we can see that um, his hands are, are really very warm, aren't they? The training of doctors is technically oriented, with far more training time spent on curative than preventive medicine. The traditional role of the doctor responds to the short-term demand of sick people to be cured, and the training of doctors reflects this. I think perhaps a little bluer than mine, but um, uh, he's pretty well perfused. His oxygen can't be too far down, despite all this shortness of breath. Poke your tongue out, that's sometimes another indication. Well, you stick your tongue out and let's have a look at that. Because <laughs> um, you need something to compare it with, in a, in a sense, don't you? To, to it I'm a little bit concerned. I've got this sharp pain in the centre of my chest here about the breastbone and a, a sort of a, a Pressing feeling on the other side. When did you first notice this? The doctor-patient relationship is intimate. It relies on close person-to-person -person contact. But preventive medicine, when practiced on a public health scale, is concerned with the health of large groups. So for the clinical doctor, the task is to fulfill the demand for cures. Even when a doctor is able to promote concepts of prevention, it can usually be done only with individuals. Well, let's pop your jacket off and uh, we'll have a look at you. When we come down to grassroots, there are two basic reasons why curative medicine wins out in this society over preventive medicine. One is that sick people demand to be cured, and because of the structure of the health insurance system, can generally afford to pay for whatever service is necessary. The second is that for healthy people, 
there is no motivation to demand preventive services to maintain their good health. As far as they're concerned, they already have it. Over the last 10 years or so, thousands of people have decided that they're going to take their fitness into their own hands and they're taking to the streets and the roads and the parks. They're strengthening their hearts and lungs, they're losing weight, and they're increasing the efficiency of their bodies. And people are finding that there are more ways than one to achieve the same result. Centres like this are springing up all over the country as people realise that in a society where activity is minimised and stress is high, that their bodies need an individual exercise program. But for the vast majority of our population, the risk factors remain. The tobacco, the alcohol, the stress, the possibility of heart disease or lung cancer. In the average working environment, there are hazards that could wipe out the value of all this exercise in seconds. And even a fit and well-conditioned body is no defence against getting injured by a motor car. Well, I was uh, heavily involved with football, playing uh, in an under-19 competition, and uh, really loved the game. Coming home one night, actually, after uh, uh, it was our trophy night for the under-19s, tyre on the car I was in blew out and uh, turned over. And uh, subsequent to that, I broke my neck and broke my back. Uh, when I was first told uh, that I wouldn't walk again, it was you know, a fairly horrific thing to handle. But then when I uh, looked around the ward and saw a number of uh, very severely uh, injured quadriplegics who had no use of their hands as well as their legs, then uh, that bitter pill wasn't that hard to swallow. So if doctors and hospitals aren't equipped to protect the mass of the population against the lifestyle risk factors, and if exercising and eating properly and keeping your weight down aren't necessarily a protection against accident and disease, whose job is it to provide preventive services to the people who live behind all these front doors? Doctors, hospitals and individuals all have a role to play in preventing disease, illness and accident in our society. But the key figure in fighting the battle for prevention is the epidemiologist. Epidemiology studies disease in whole communities. You can't work out why uh, people get heart attacks by only studying people who've had heart attacks in a hospital. You have to compare them with people who haven't had heart attacks. So to do that, you need to go out and study a whole group and see which ones get heart attacks and which ones don't and what makes them different. And that's the sort of thing that epidemiologists do. And by doing that, they can help identify the causes of disease that lie in our lifestyle. In some cases, we have very specific causes that epidemiology can identify. For example, asbestos is a very potent, specific cause of cancer. Now, in these sorts of situations, of course, you can take very specific control measures. You can remove asbestos from the human environment, and uh, from working environments in particular, and those kinds of control measures are now underway. The major success of epidemiology has been identifying the probable causal relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. As early as the 1930s, surgeons who were operating on lung cancer patients had the impression that there were more smokers amongst these cases than amongst their other patients. But it wasn't until the 1950s, early 1950s, that epidemiologists like Sir Richard Dole actually succeeded by careful statistical studies in demonstrating this relationship. And uh, epidemiology has gone on from there to major complex diseases like heart disease. There's been a lot of work done around the world establishing that various things increase your risk of heart attack, like having a high blood pressure, like being a cigarette smoker, and like having a high level of cholesterol in your blood. Now, 
this knowledge has led to public action by the heart foundations and public health bodies around the world. In many countries, there's been big drops in death rates from heart disease. We can't be sure that the drops have been because of the advice, but it's likely that the advice has played some role. And the drops have really been quite big. In countries like Australia and the United States, there's been a drop of over 25% since the mid-60s. And that's the main reason why life expectancies jumped so much in those two countries. I mean, in Australia, it jumped, male life expectancy at birth jumped by three years in the 1970s, after actually declining in the 1960s. One of the most spectacularly successful public health measures in recent years has been the fluoridation of water supplies. The benefits of fluoride were discovered using epidemiological methods, and since it's been in use, the amount of tooth decay in communities with fluoride in their water has dropped tremendously. This drop has forced a change in the role of the dentist, whose services are now more preventive than curative. This has all happened with very little money being spent. The cost of adding fluoride powder to the water supply is minimal, but results in a tremendous saving to the community in the cost of dental care, as well as a huge advance in well-being and comfort from all those who benefit from not having teeth like these. That's one of the huge advantages of preventive public health measures, as against the development of high-tech, hospital-based curative medicine. Public health measures can benefit an enormous number of people at a very low cost per head while high-tech curative medicine can help a few people at enormously high cost per head. And public health measures don't necessarily need to be medically based. Take legislation designed to reduce alcohol consumption in drivers, for example. No medicine in that. But the effect on public health has been very considerable. Sometimes uh, things can change quite quickly. I think the story of car smash deaths here in Victoria is a real success story. You had information from epidemiologists, you had the involvement and commitment of the doctors who were working to try and treat people who were injured, namely the Australian College of Surgeons. You had the press involved. Within a you had a raising of public consciousness, a change in public attitudes. With the change in public attitudes, you had new laws, seatbelt laws and so on. And within a decade, the number of deaths had fallen by half. And if you expressed the deaths in relation to the number of vehicles on the road, it had fallen, in fact, by 60% in, in 10 years. Now, that's a real success story. January of this year, when the O5 came in, I was on call most of January because of other people having holidays. And I left a lot of time for theatre to patch up people that you'd expect to be involved in motor vehicle accidents and needing things done. And it was absolutely dramatic in that month that there were no cases to do. I mean, there were a few, but nowhere near the number. And in fact, we had lists going empty or calling in routine cases to fill in the theatre time because they just, they just weren't there. The cases just weren't involved. The kinds of injuries they're suffering are far less, whereas before, someone might have three major fractures in both legs. They might now only have one, or that one won't be compound, whereas before it was, the skin was broken, or before we'd have a lot of trouble with bone healing because there's so much force involved that the bone would die. That's not happening so much now. I think that people are healing up quicker, if you like, because people aren't driving as fast or as recklessly or hitting the poles as fast as they used to. If the well-being of the public can be improved enormously by such relatively simple measures as putting fluoride in water and legislating against drinking drivers, why isn't preventive medicine practised more widely in this country? One of the reasons lies in the fact that sometimes individuals may stand to suffer economically by the introduction of measures like these. Since random uh, breath testing in 0.05 was introduced in January, uh, surveys conducted by the Australian Hotels Association indicate that there has been a consistent loss of business right through the uh, hotel and the hospitality industry of some 15 to 20 per cent. And uh, this has been indicative of uh, running through from uh, take-home package market to uh, food market to bar market. And uh, in itself, it has cost some 3,000 jobs in the hotel sector of the industry throughout Australia. The same sort of political problem applies, but to a larger extent, with tobacco. Tobacco companies are large employers 
large earners and large taxpayers. Direct cigarette advertising on television has been banned, but tobacco companies continue to use their money and political strength to maintain a high profile in indirect TV advertising through sports sponsorship. Sporting sponsorship has three effects. It, it gives them um, connection with the excellence of sport and culture, that sort of thing, that they weren't able to get in their ordinary advertising because of the self-regulatory rules. It also gives them access to television in ways that they never had before. It's been estimated that over 40,000 shots of the Benson Hedges brand logo were shown on television in the 1980-81 cricket season. And that just couldn't have been bought uh, with money if, if advertising were allowed. But I think the, the third and most sinister effect of, of all is that they've been able to buy the silence of a constituency, uh, and I speak here of sporting uh, heroes, especially sporting heroes of the young. Uh, so we see the spectacle of uh, members of the Australian cricket team, for example, coming out and actually supporting the tobacco industry in their fights with the health uh, lobby. and. Uh, I think this is a deplorable situation where you have people who should be involved in promoting health by their activities actually going hand in hand with the tobacco industry because they're financially dependent upon them. It'll reach a point very soon, I think, if it hasn't reached it already, that sporting administrators are blithely accepting tobacco money in all the uh, celebratory atmosphere that surrounds, you know, getting a big deal from a tobacco company, will be forced to think again because public opinion will be such that they will be frankly embarrassed to be seen to be associating with an industry like that. I've been working in this area myself for about four or five years and I've seen remarkable changes in that time in public opinion. I think that probably many of the health ministers around the country personally feel very committed to uh, introducing legislative changes in this area but of course they're only one one person in cabinet they have to convince their cabinet colleagues that such a step is in tune with public opinion and I think that it's there that groups like the cancer societies, the doctors, the consumer associations and so forth are creating groundswells of public opinion which just cannot be ignored. Voices in Cabinet also discuss the split of public funds between preventive and curative services. Most preventive medicine is in one way or another carried out by the public sector. And the public purse can only buy so much health care. And, as we said earlier, people in this society demand and expect cures. So most of the money for public medical services goes to building and equipping hospitals. Which is fair enough. Hospitals and medical hardware are crucial to the well-being of our society, and prevention and cure should work hand in hand. But Australia's curative medical services rate with the best in the world while our preventive services still have a long way to go to fulfil the potential they have in giving all of us a better life. I think one of our great problems is to persuade the Australian community to put more resources into preventive rather than curative medicine. Yet when we look at the major diseases in our society, the major killers in our society, there are four of them. Accidents, heart attacks, strokes and cancer. And none of those can be effectively cured. All we can provide is palliatives. What we need to deal with each of those major diseases of affluent society is long-term preventive programs, particularly preventive programs beginning with young people, because only by changes in lifestyle and changes in environment will we really make breakthroughs with those diseases. Now, of course, the big task is to persuade people to shift some of our health resources from curative medicine to long-term preventive programs. And there are difficulties in doing that. Most of the vested interests in health are, of course, built around curative structures, around hospitals, around the medical profession. And uh, we have to persuade those powerful groups to agree to shifts in resources. Secondly, any campaign which aims at preventing in the long term these diseases in our society will come into conflict with powerful vested interests. Business groups which perhaps have an interest in selling particular forms of drugs which underlie some of our problems. Uh, businesses which may be reluctant to change workplace structures to, in order to prevent accidents. So again, we often need to take on some very powerful vested interests if we're to have effective preventive programs. And 
those kinds of issues are only going to be solved. We're only going to have, we politicians, are only going to be able to deal with those problems when we've got effective grassroots support for carrying through preventive campaigns which will sometimes upset powerful vested interests. I think in practice it's very hard for the average individual to go against the drift of the people around them. If most people around them are behaving one way and you tell them they should be behaving another way, I think they tend to ignore you. Of course, it's a chicken and egg, because it's only by giving advice to individuals that you begin to get the drift of opinion. But certainly, once there's the drift of opinion, then uh, the thing tends to snowball. And you can encourage the drift of opinion by things that are directed to the whole community, not just to individuals. By things like uh, increased no-smoking zones, for example, if you're trying to shift opinion about smoking by uh, changed labelling on food products if you're trying to change, shift opinion about diet and what foods are best for health. So there are public actions you can take um, to help. And of course the object is to get both things working together in balance. Well, here I am, still out running, logging up an, an extra few kilometres, trying to minimise a few of those potential risks and just basically keeping myself in good shape and enjoying myself. As a biophysicist and a runner, I know that there's more than, to the question of public health than just having a few athletes out training like me. And here's a great Australian to tell you a little bit more about what public health can be in this country. I once defined the broad general objective of medicine as to provide for everyone the fullest measure of health and length of life that is allowed by his genetic constitution that natural death should come at a median age of about 85, with very few deaths before 70 or after 100. I know very well that this is still a long way off, but there is no escaping the fact that the changes in the life expectancy of the Western world over the last 100 years point very strongly in that direction. One can deduce from indirect evidence that probably 80% of lethal cancer is in one way or another related to the physical or social environment. However, apart from the cigarette and one or two occupational hazards, the causes of these things have not yet been pinpointed. To sort them out will be a job for epidemiologists in the future. When one reaches my age, all that one can look for is a relatively healthy old age and a good death. We must look forward, I believe, to making this possible for everyone. Well, it's comforting to know that all that's possible, but it's not going to happen overnight. And in the meantime, it's probably a good idea to make sure that we take a few preventative measures of our own in the form of getting some regular exercise, looking after your diet, and certainly if you're a smoker or a drinker, trying to eliminate those things from your lifestyle. And by doing a few of these things, we'll make sure that we're all around to enjoy a society where public health plays a much more important part.